their eyes will be able to communicate this to you, honestly. That's how you can tell if someone is a narcissist, simply by looking at their face. No, 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 no. Hello, hello. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Ana Yudin. I'm a doctor of clinical psychology and an author. And today I'm going to be reacting to some TikTok videos about narcissism. Now, the pop cultureification of narcissism is something that I have talked about on my channel before. It's not a take that makes me particularly popular on the internet. To give you just a sort of baseline of my perspective, as somebody trained as a therapist, I think there is a lot of misinformation online about narcissism, a lot of demonization of it. Frankly, I think 99% of content about narcissism is just flat out untrue and oftentimes a form of projection. And I say this as a person who has experienced the wrath of narcissism very closely, okay? <laughs> if you have read my novel, you probably have a sense of just how closely. I completely understand why people find this diagnosis harmful and dangerous. There are certainly many traits within the NPD criteria themselves that have a lot of potential for the narcissist to hurt the people around them. But with that being said, I don't think everybody who's diagnosed with this disorder is going to go on to behave in ways that hurt other people. I do think there is a spectrum in terms of how self-aware a person can be, like in any disorder, OCD, depression, narcissism, any really mental disorder or personality disorder lies on a spectrum in terms of insight and self-awareness that a person can have. So I would hate for there to be people out there who are truly trying to work on this diagnosis, trying to improve themselves to not hurt the people in their life that are basically being demonized because of this diagnosis, which is, by the way, in most cases created by trauma. And I would also hate for us to sort of make narcissism the big bad boogeyman that's to blame for everything when a lot of times what we're talking about is just abusiveness and not all abusers are narcissists and not all narcissists are abusers. It's important for us to use clear language and when we're talking about narcissism, actually talk about narcissism. And when we're just describing abusive behavior, explain that that's what we're talking about. So anyway, that was just my brief intro into my stance on this topic. Let's get into some of these videos. Do you know that you can tell if someone is a narcissist by their face, simply by looking at their face. Yes, you can. And you know how? That's by looking at their eyes. The eyes are the window of the soul. Now, a narcissist's eyes are blank. It's just like a blank stare. There's nothing behind the eyes. And you will be able to tell. So I understand why people say this, because lack of empathy or low empathy is a criterion of narcissism. And when someone has sort of a blank stare, especially when the other person is feeling emotional or dysregulated, and a person is just kind of responding to you with a blank stare, it can feel kind of like that soulless expression. Like you really don't see that this person is pouring their heart out and you just don't care. So in a sense, I understand that. But I'm also very, very wary of pathologizing people's facial expressions and using that as a way to diagnose or pseudo-diagnose because people love to say, well, I'm just talking about narcissistic traits and then they describe literally the criteria of narcissism. We shouldn't be pseudo-diagnosing people based on their facial features, okay? That's a very dangerous path to go down. Some people are raised to believe that they have no right to feel emotions and they sort of wear a mask of flat emotionlessness on their face so that other people can't tell what they're feeling so that they can protect themselves. I would hate for somebody in that situation or somebody with autism, for instance, to be pathologized and sort of painted as a narcissist by people that know nothing about them simply because a random person on the internet is saying this is a dead giveaway of narcissism. Let's continue. No matter how seductive, how charming this person is, you will be able to tell. You'll also get that feeling in your gut. Your intuition will also be screaming at you and saying, this person isn't right. It's their energy. Again, it's so much more nuanced than that. I'm all for people trusting their safety signals. And when somebody is making them feel like something's not right or something's not safe, honoring that, getting themselves to safety, avoiding that person. On the other hand, I have also noticed this trend of people 
using gut feeling or intuition or energy kind of as a cop out for treating someone poorly or avoiding them or assuming that they're a bad person without any evidence for it. What we perceive as safe versus unsafe is based on a lot of different things. It's based on our past experiences. It's based on very instinctual cues. You know, like if somebody is coming at you with their chest puffed out really aggressively, you know, your body's probably going to instantly perceive that as danger. And it's also influenced by things like our own personal triggers, our own personal traumas, things that we haven't resolved that we're maybe misinterpreting in other people. For instance, if somebody gets uh, run over by a red truck, then they go on to be afraid of all red trucks. It happens similarly with people too. You know, if you've been burned by someone who low facial expressiveness, and then you meet someone with low facial expressiveness, and you have this quote unquote gut feeling that this person is not safe, something's not right, I don't fuck with their energy. You're completely within your right to remove yourself and get yourself to safety. And you can't be judging people without actual evidence. Their energy will match what's going on. Their energy will never lie to you. So their eyes will be able to communicate that to you if you look closely. But honestly, it's to do with the eyes. When someone is staring at you blankly, but they're also smiling, this is a big red flag. So it's true that when someone is smiling with their lips, but not their eyes, that's usually a fake smile. It's different neural pathways when we fake smile versus real smile. But there are a lot of different reasons why somebody could be putting up a fake smile. They could have social anxiety. They themselves could have complex trauma. They could just be nervous about the situation. They might not trust you yet. You know, I'm all for making note of people's body language, but I'm not all for making assumptions about people's body language. You can note, oh, this person looks like maybe they feel anxious. But at the end of the day, the only way to really know is to inhabit that person's reality and maybe just ask them and hope that they're honest. You could actually find out that there's a lot more under the surface than just assuming the worst case scenario right away. Their eyes will be able to communicate this to you, honestly. That's how you can tell if someone is a narcissist, simply by looking at their face. No, 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 no. Diagnosing narcissism and even traits of narcissism is an extremely complex task that even many seasoned psychologists cannot master unless they have adequate experience, supervision, continued education. Personality disorders are very complex and the traits are very specific and facial expressions are not one of the criteria. Please do not listen to this. Please do not diagnose people as narcissists or psychopaths or whatever based on their facial expressions. Next, let's hear from somebody who actually says they are a diagnosed malignant narcissist on this topic of the narcissistic stare. Hi, I'm a diagnosed malignant narcissist and I'm going to talk about the narcissistic slash sociopathic stare. First of all, flat effect is part of my disorder. That's just how my face looks. Oh well. Second of all, when people say that our eyes turn black when we're angry, there's nothing abnormal about that. That happens to everybody. Your pupils dilate in response to something that triggers the fight or flight response. All that's happening is that our pupils are dilating because we are angry with you, afraid. Yes, so let me just say this. I have been in the presence of someone with this disorder whose eyes suddenly went black with anger. And I remember it being very scary and feeling almost like spiritual in that moment, you know, like a demonic possession type thing. Because it can be very scary when you realize that somebody's anger just switches like this suddenly over such a minor perceived trigger. And she's completely right that it is a normal reaction. All of our pupils dilate in certain situations, when we're excited, when we're sexually aroused, when we're angry, when we're afraid, that is normal. Pupils dilating is one of the normal responses of physiological arousal, which is a part of many, many emotions. I think the reason why it's associated with narcissism very often is because of that very quick trigger into fight or flight, specifically the fight for many narcissists. And because of how frequently it happens, because when a person has narcissism, the triggers are not so much external. And this is actually true of most personality disorders. The triggers might be tiny, tiny things like somebody looked at you the wrong way or somebody said something that offended you. But when you really look at the objective facts of the situation, that trigger was so tiny or so neutral or ambiguous that it shouldn't have created the intensely dysregulated reaction that it did. 
the problem is what narcissists or, you know, all people do when they overinflate a trigger. It's the way that they think about it. You know, if somebody says to you, I actually disagree with that, and you fly into a rage, anger is an emotion that overall people feel when we feel like our rights have been violated, when we feel like an injustice has occurred against us. In that moment, a narcissist has perceived that person disagreeing with them as an injustice occurring against them, as a violation against them. That is where the issue is. Not necessarily the fact that they feel a perfectly natural emotion, not necessarily the fact that their pupils dilate. The issue lies within their interpretation of an innocuous trigger that should be a normal part of human interaction as something to blow up on someone over. It's not some demonic entity that overtakes our soul in that moment and where we turn into an entirely different person. It's still us. This type of thing can happen to literally anybody. I am sure every single one of your pupils have dilated at some point in your life. Maybe it happens more frequently to narcissists and sociopaths, but it's still nothing supernatural. The only thing I can think of that differs from a normal person is that I personally have and do use it to intimidate people. I mean, if I already have it, I might as well like, use it for my advantage. Yeah, that's true. It can also be weaponized against people if you can tell that you're scaring them to sort of get what you want. To go a little bit into what you mentioned about like it's not a demonic entity possessing them. I think that it is so easy to slip into this mindset that everybody with this particular personality disorder is a demon and terrible and devalued. And like I said, I know how much this personality disorder can hurt the people around them. But I want to be very mindful about not falling into the same defense mechanisms that we accuse narcissists of. Narcissists often project, they often devalue and idealize people fluctuating between them based on the situation. They devalue and idealize themselves. They sometimes split people into groups of all bad or groups of all good. When we do that, when we ourselves say, all narcissists are bad, all narcissists are evil. And I'm just the little old me, I'm just the little old empath who can do no wrong. We're using those same defense mechanisms. We're using idealization and devaluation. We're using splitting. And in a sense, we're using projection because we're accusing them of the same things that we are doing. And this is why I struggle with the demonization of narcissism that's taken a hold on the internet is because people think if they can call someone a narcissist and devalue them, that that makes them exempt from looking at their own stuff. Someone having a diagnosis of NPD doesn't make them all bad and doesn't make you all good. It doesn't mean that you also don't have stuff to work through. It doesn't mean that you don't sometimes take part in those same behaviors. Also, one last thing about this video, I noticed she says diagnosed malignant narcissist. That's something that I'm curious about because malignant and vulnerable narcissism spoken about in the literature, they're in the research as the two main uh, types of narcissism, covert and overt are actually not that scientific. So if you hear covert or overt narcissism being talked about on the internet, you know, generally a sign to check that person's credentials. Um, while malignant narcissism is a subtype of narcissism that is talked about in the research and in the literature, it's not an actual diagnosis. You know, we don't diagnose based on malignant or vulnerable. We diagnose based on the same set of criteria that are common to both. Just be aware, you know, that it's not like you get diagnosed differently based on the subtype. With a narcissist, when we're talking about the face, for instance, I've noticed a, a pattern which is the, the, the face, the, the mouth, as I said before, they seem to be interested and excited about you. They're talking about you, they're listening to you, but the eyes are kind of dead. Like I mentioned in a previous video, if somebody's smiling with their mouth but not their eyes, that is probably a fake smile. But what does Robert Greene mean by when I see a narcissist doing this? Because Robert Greene has a Bachelor of Arts in the classics. He's not a psychologist, he's not a therapist, he doesn't have any graduate experience in this topic, and he often talks about facial expressions and micro expressions that are not really empirically solid ground. So I'm wondering, first of all, how do you know who's a narcissist and who's not, given that you are not a trained psychologist? And secondly, you know, why are we still talking about micro expressions and facial expressions being used to diagnose someone? Because that's not the way professionals do it at all. Engaging yeah. with you, yeah. right? They're, they're re repeating what you say. They're asking you questions, but the eyes are dead. There's no life in them. It's just as if they're not even looking at a human being. It's if they're looking at an object. Oh my God. One but thing that's really interesting here 
This is like the third comment from the top. LOL, no one is matching the description with the girl above in the video talking about the person interviewing Robert Greene. This is the perfect depiction of what is wrong with spreading this misinformation, with spreading the idea that you can tell if somebody's a narcissist based on their facial expressions. This person clearly decided that they do not like the woman in this video because of whatever reasons. If I were to venture a guess, I would say it's maybe because she's a very beautiful woman. And because of that pre-existing bias of, oh, I don't like this person, you then get to make up a story about how to pathologize them based on tiny facial expressions that you have no insight into what it actually means about that person. When we normalize this sort of pseudo-diagnosis of people based on things like facial expressions, this is what the risk is. It's that any person can say to another person, you're a narcissist, I don't like you because of the way your face looks. And that is so dangerous. Let's go into a couple more videos from people who say they're actual diagnosed narcissists. So whenever you hurt a narcissist's feelings, they will go out of their way to make your life hard. And of course, if you're new here, I'm actually a diagnosed narcissist. So now it's extremely easy to hurt a narcissist's feelings. I know a lot of people are just like, hey, how do you hurt a narcissist? Y'all say no to a narcissist, reject them. That's a very common misconception that narcissists are the grandiose facade that they put on. No, that is a defense mechanism. The real narcissist is the person underneath that who's the very opposite of what they project to the world. It is actually very, very easy to trigger a narcissist. All you have to do is just give the slightest inkling that they're not enough or that you disagree with them. Or that's why things like narcissistic rage come up because it's tiny little things that um, trigger them. It's kind of like going through the world without any skin. You know, everything hurts you if you have no skin. Everything feels like a, an extremely painful trigger. Shame into their lives and it hurts their feelings. But if you hurt their feelings, they a lot, a lot of narcissists will absolutely seek vengeance on you because that's the only way to get rid of the shame within us is to seek vengeance and make sure that you feel the same way or worse than what we feel. This is very often the way that it works with narcissism. A narcissist feels triggered, their self-esteem feels shaky all of a sudden, and they feel so bad, they feel so much shame in that moment that they want the person that made them feel that way feel just as bad or worse. And so oftentimes they'll do that through cruelty, abusiveness, but they can also do it through something called projective identification. And this is a defense mechanism when you make the other person feel the way that you yourself feel in that moment. So if you as the narcissist feel ashamed, you make the other person feel ashamed. You go into this tirade about how uh, inadequate they are and all the things they did wrong and all the ways in which they suck. But again, this is not just specific to narcissism. I think it's very, very common in narcissism. It can also be common in other personality disorders and it can also be common in anybody who just has maybe uh, low emotional intelligence, who doesn't have the skills to sort of acknowledge their own emotions, to validate their own emotions, and then figure out a way to respond effectively to the situation. And this is all stuff that I talk about in the connection course. There's an entire chapter in there on emotion expression and regulation. And so if you struggle with this and you're like, oh, fuck, I do this. I hope I'm not a narcissist. You are not beyond hope, okay? There are skills you can learn to become more interpersonally effective with other people, to become aware of when that's happening and manage your own reactions before you lash out on another person. And ideally, when you feel a powerful, painful emotion, that conflict should bring you closer with the person in question, not make things worse and messy. Let's keep watching. Hurt as badly as I'm hurting or more than I'm hurting because you bore shame to me. I need to shake. I need to get rid of this shame in me. And the crazy thing about it is, y'all, you can hurt a narcissist's feelings by breaking up with them for something that they have done to you. Like if they cheat on you, they beat on you, they lie to you, they steal from you or whatever. That hurts their feelings. They, they still feel rejected. It they they still feel like you overreacted, so they seek vengeance on you for that. It is a wild mindset sometimes being a narcissist, y'all. I encourage you all to continue seeking information about narcissism from therapists and people who have the disorder rather than people who just label narcissism as whatever they don't like. So I'm a diagnosed narcissist, and if you do any of these three things, then you're not a narcissist. Do you feel like your emotions are genuine? Because for me, whether it comes to a funeral or it comes to my friend going through a breakup or it comes to me being happy for somebody's achievement, I'm faking emotions all the time because I know it's what's expected of me. Narcissists don't have those normal emotional reactions. We have to emulate them half the time. 
too. Yeah, so that one really comes down to the low empathy criterion. And I wouldn't say it's that they never feel emotions. They do certainly feel emotions, but they feel anger, they feel sadness. It's more so like emotions where you're supposed to feel what the other person is feeling that rely on empathy. Two, do you think that every person in the world has equal inherent worth? Narcissists think hierarchically. It's an inconceivable to us that two people can have inherently the same amount of worth. For me, there's always going to be a better person and a person below. And three, do you... That's so funny that he says that. I've never thought that is, uh, you know, linked to narcissism, but I do remember years ago when I made some video and spoke about how we all have inherent worth. I think it was maybe like about self-esteem. I got some really angry comments from people saying, what do you mean people have equal worth? They absolutely do not. Some people are inherently more valuable than others. I don't know if those people were narcissists or not. The list he's saying, like, there's no list for like... This is if you're not a narcissist. It's either you meet the criteria or you don't. But it certainly makes sense why this would be linked to narcissism because wanting to associate with high caliber people is another one of those criteria. You love yourself. A lot of people think narcissists love themselves. No, we think we're better than everybody else. We might love how we look. We might love our intelligence. But my internal monologue is a constant stream of, you're so stupid. Why did you do that? You're better than all these other people. How could you be so stupid? There is no self-love, there is no self-compassion there, it's just grandiosity. Yeah, and when people criticize self-compassion, saying like, oh, it's narcissistic to be gentle with yourself when you make a mistake, or it's narcissistic to just love yourself, no, it's not. Like, my dude, you do not know what narcissism is. Narcissism is a deep pit of low self-worth that constantly needs to be masked with all these charades of grandiosity and cloaked in these defense mechanisms. And at every single point, narcissists feel like they have to prove their self-worth to themselves, to other people. Person that loves themselves, that is self-compassionate, they're probably not a narcissist. That is the antithesis of what a narcissist is. Never trust a narcissist mask. It is the very opposite of what's underneath that mask. And even when we talk about like malignant versus vulnerable narcissism, malignant narcissists tend to, tend to put this foot forward of, I am the most grandiose person in the world. I step on other people with no issue. Whereas vulnerable narcissists take more of the, woe is me, everyone's always uh, so mean to me, I'm always a victim, and sort of guilt-tripping people. Don't let that fool you into thinking that malignant narcissists are truly grandiose underneath. Both of them have very, very shaky core self-esteem. It's just that they operate with different defense mechanisms. I diagnosed a narcissist, and yesterday my psychologist clocked me with the biggest fucking ego check ever, and now I get why narcissists tend not to be diagnosed. See, I think I'm pretty self-aware. Like, I do know I have manipulative tendencies. I do know that I lie. I do know that I've gaslit people in the past, blah, blah, blah. I've let my therapist know that. Anyways, um, about to sound like a total asshole. A few weeks ago, my partner called me a narcissist. He works in the mental health field. He sent me a huge paragraph and was like, you really need to show your psych this. And I was like, okay, fine, I will. I also showed her a few screenshots of the arguments we've had. She was like, this is literally not in line with anything you told me about him. You are the antagonistic one here. You've been painting yourself to be this, like, martyr. And you've been throwing him under the bus. So what are you doing here? Anyways, I saw a video by the nameless narcissist where he talks about how he can only see things from a narcissism point of view. How his only reality is where everything always is a competition, where he always has to be the best at everything. That's how he's always perceived in the world. And I watched that and I was like, doesn't everyone experience that? So I brought that up to my therapist yesterday and then she was like, okay, listen, after you sent me the screenshots, I've been going through the notes and you have a lot of holes in your stories. You didn't say it meanly, I'm making it sound mean. She said it nicely, but like she was being firm. You came into therapy very depressed in a crisis situation, which I've done with every single psychologist I've ever had. Something bad would happen in my life, and I was like, shit, need therapy, would go to therapy. And the pattern that's always happened with every psych I've had is that after I get out of that crisis situation, I start getting better, and then they start being like, hey, do you wanna just do like bi-weekly sessions? And I'm like, yeah, sure, look at me, I'm doing great, and usually I just end up ghosting them. My therapist was gonna recommend bi-weekly because she was like, look, we got you out of that crisis situation that you came to me for, and we've been basically shooting the shit the rest of the entire fucking however long we've been seeing each other. You're a charismatic client. You're fun to talk to, whatever, but that's not the point of therapy. It feels like I'm more just validating your ego because what you really ask me a lot of the times is how, like, I perceive you. I'm not asking how to get better. You're more like, oh, so, like, how would this make me look? And you're clearly painting false narratives of things where it feels like you're not putting on airs. You're completely minimizing and downplaying the behaviors that you do while completely inflating the behaviors 
of others, I thought I really was doing better. In short, I have reduced my borderline symptoms because I also have BPD from severe to mild. That I have worked on. But she is kind of right. I kind of saw therapy as a, like a game, I guess. I wasn't like intentionally doing that. But I thought this was so insightful and so cool to watch. It really is rare to find a therapist who's that good. There have been studies done showing that most therapists think they're above average. And honestly, this is not even specific to therapists. Most people rate themselves as above average on things that are important to them. And obviously that, you know, the math ain't mathin'. But it's actually quite rare to find a therapist who can pinpoint personality features when they're not showing up in the room. It's very easy for a therapist to just blindly validate what a narcissistic client is saying because they don't realize that they're hearing a distortion of reality. They're not sort of tallying up those things that make a pattern. Psychodynamic therapists often look underneath the hood of the car. Most other therapists, they kind of just take clients at their word. They either, you know, validate what the client is saying or they try to work on um, their emotions and behaviors and thoughts. Psychodynamic therapists pay attention to defense mechanisms. They pay attention to the opposite that's underneath the cloak, if you remember that metaphor. So they might be a little bit more prone to catch on that somebody is displaying narcissistic behaviors or defense mechanisms. And if you find a therapist like that, they are really gold. It's always so incredible when that happens. Yes, I was. So yeah, distorted reality. She's the first like that's ever picked up on it. I didn't realize I was doing it and I pretty self-aware. I will say though, again, this is not just a narcissism thing. I was actually gonna make a video on how we distort stories. This was months ago and I almost scripted it out and then I decided, ah, I don't know that people are really gonna care about this so much, but it's absolutely something that we all do. It might be more common in people with personality disorders, but we all to some extent kind of put more weight on our own perspective, dismiss the other person's perspective and validate them, overinflate our strengths, downplay our weaknesses and do the very opposite it to the other person. So after sifting through all the threats of how I should be shipped off to an island somewhere, how I'm the villain, how my eyebrows somehow make me the narcissist, how I look like a narcissist. Mental health matters does not apply to narcissism in any way, shape, or form because you automatically have an image of me that you can't remove yourself from. Came on here and made a video talking about the symptoms that I do. Symptoms that normally people would not admit to, like manipulation and lying and gaslighting. Yeah, does that make me kind of a shitty person for doing those things? Yes. I came on here to to admit my flaws, to take accountability, to say I was in therapy and actually kind of lying to my therapist because I was having a distorted reality. I did not deny it or deflect it. Instead, I came on here, accepted it, acknowledged it, and posted a video for millions of people to see. Not so that I could fuel some sort of motive. And just to raise awareness of a stigmatized disorder. I get it. I get why a lot of y'all are projecting. I have borderline. There's a stigma for borderline as well. It's not as stigmatized as narcissism, but there's still a stigma all the same. You coming on here automatically deeming I'm evil and abusive, that I should rather, instead of be a part of society, I am getting treatment. I am in therapy. I've been in therapy for two years. I have reduced my borderline symptoms from severe to mild. And to anyone telling me that you can't have BPD and MPD, Take it up with my doctor. I have a dual diagnosis. I don't know what to tell you there. There's different types of narcissists. I am the type, the covert type. I am driven a lot by insecurity and shame. For me to come on here, it was honestly kind of scary. I knew there was a stigma. I knew that I was probably gonna get hate for it. And I didn't want to get too emotionally invested because I knew the hate would probably get to me. And a little bit did. That's probably why I'm making this. But I'm also making this to show that presumptions just based off a three minute video automatically assumed that you knew my character, which is fine. I don't know you, you don't know me, we'll never meet. But there are people out there every day doing the behaviors that I do, whether they're narcissists or not. I'm trying to help people that also have those behaviors, learn them, acknowledge them, and change them. To have these preconceptions about a disorder automatically shows that mental health awareness is okay, except for certain disorders. MPD being one of them. As someone who has gotten traumatized by a narcissist, Yes, narcissists can be traumatized by the narcissist. It sucks. It really hurts. And I get why some of you don't like me because of that. But not all narcissists are the same. Some narcissists can be self-aware. Some narcissists can admit to their toxicity. Some narcissists can be in therapy. And some narcissists actually do want to try and get better. Um. I think regardless of what a person does, they approach their issues with wanting accountability, wanting to increase their self-awareness, being honest about what they've done. That to me is the most important. You know, I've sat as a therapist with clients who have done objectively terrible things. 
But when a person takes accountability and they own what they've done and they want to do better in how they treat others, that is the most important thing, known as beyond redemption. And there's this whole idea that narcissists or people with personality disorders cannot be self-aware by definition, that low self-awareness is part of the diagnosis. And again, some therapists feel that way. I actually disagree. I think if we can have self-aware people with OCD, self-aware people with depression, why can't we have a person who has a personality disorder diagnosis and is able to own it and wants to improve? There are so many billions of people out there, it's not outside the realm of possibility. And if we've gotten to a point in society where this diagnosis is so stigmatized that people literally send threats to people who are open about it, that just tells me the people doing that probably felt triggered because there was probably something in what you described you do that they themselves do. They probably couldn't stand to see their own behavior reflected honestly on screen, and they had decided to, again, project their shame through projective identification and make you feel the way that they felt. Or they said, you're part of a category of people that have hurt me, and therefore you and everybody in that category is a terrible person that needs to be shipped off to an island. Then they're splitting on you, which again is a very primitive defense mechanism that they should be working on in therapy. This is the risk of what happens. This is what happens when we demonize entire groups of diagnoses. All right, I think I'll stop here, you guys. I hope that this video was interesting and helpful to you if you have any other questions or if you have any video suggestions in general, pop those down below. I'll try to get to them when I get a chance. Hope you have a lovely rest of your week and take care.